In early August 1991, a ship known as MTS Oceanos was en route from East London, South Africa to Durban when a series of events, seemingly spurred by the rough nature of the seas that day, resulted in uncontrolled flooding. Confused and scared, passengers attempted to look to the crew to help them. But as it turned out, the captain was in no state to help the passengers, and many of the officers had already left the ship without even attempting to coordinate some sort of evacuation. And as a result, hundreds of people were left stranded on the stricken vessel at the mercy of the sea and with only the entertainment staff to rely on for possible salvation. MTS Oceanos was actually a French-built ship, but it was Greek-owned. She was originally laid down all the way back on March 6, 1951, and launched July 12th of 1952. She was officially completed in June of 1953, and remained in service from that time until 1991. Oceanos was not her original name. She was known as Jean Laborde, and was the last of four sister ships built for Massageries Maritimes. Throughout the decades, she passed through many different owners, as well as name changes. She had at least five different names, but Oceanos is what she was called when she was acquired by Apiratiki Lines of Greece in 1976. By 1991, it was pretty well known that she was in rough shape. She was old, for one, but she also hadn't been maintained as well as she probably should have been. She had a 10 centimeter hole in her watertight bulkhead, therefore making it not watertight at all. And she had loose hull plates, as well as check valves that had been completely removed for repairs. In the day of this particular cruise, she was dealing with a faulty waste disposal system in the engine room. That was in the process of being repaired as she left port. And she'd been delayed by a bomb threat, of all things. When it was found that this was a hoax, she was allowed to leave, but she was late. And the crew pushed her to try to make up some time, even though the waves that day were very rough. She was under the command of Captain Giannis Avranis who by that point had been an officer for 20 years, as well as a sailor for 30. He had plenty of experience. So even though he was sailing Oceanos into 40 knot winds and 9 meter swells, the crew trusted him to know exactly what he was doing. But as night fell, things began to take a turn for the worst. Oceanos actually had a wedding party on board at the time, and there should have been a sail away party on deck as she, well, sailed away. But because of how rough it was, the party was held inside the Four Seasons Lounge. But a lot of passengers chose to stay in their cabins because, frankly, it was just kind of miserable. But the storm as it was, it made it very difficult to actually enjoy the cruise. When the first sitting of dinner was served, waiters could hardly carry the trays of food without dropping something. Oceanos was being tossed around like a rag doll, and it all came to a head at about 9.30 p.m. The repairs to the waste disposal system hadn't been completed, and as such, a critical ventilation pipe, which ran through the watertight aft bulkhead and the non-return valves, weren't actually replaced yet at all. The suspected cause of her flooding has to do with the freak waves that kept slamming against her. Eventually, the pipe's shell plating burst open due to the shocks and began to fill the compartment with seawater. Now, that could have been controlled if the waste disposal system was functioning properly, but because it wasn't, there weren't any check valves to stop the flow. So not only was the water flooding the engine room, but it began to back up throughout every toilet and shower in the ship. And because it was flooding the engine room, not only did it stop her engines, but it also shorted the generators. The ship had no power, and thus she was left stricken in the rough seas and began taking on even more water. Now remember, Avranis is the captain, and he has a duty to protect his ship, but more intrinsically, all the souls on board. So naturally he called for an abandoned ship, and by abandoned ship he means he and the crew could abandon ship, but he didn't actually tell anyone 
else that they were abandoning ship because that might have been helpful. Well, Oceanos rolled so badly that furniture was falling over inside the ship. No alarm or announcement had been given that she was even in any danger at all, let alone that the crew was leaving. Enter Moss Hills, as well as his wife, Tracy Hills. They were musicians on board the ship. He, a guitarist, and his wife, a bassist, and they had worked on plenty of ships before. They'd been on the ocean long enough to know that none of this was normal, and he grew curious as to why there were no crew members simply attempted to guide the passengers to where they should be. They explored a little bit below decks and discovered the, uh, well, the flooding, and thus assumed that the ship was sinking, which they were correct. And then they found the cruise director, Lorraine Betts, who told them that the captain had indeed given the order to abandon ship and that some of the crew had already left. They attempted to launch the lifeboats, but they weren't able to start their engines, and Oceanos was starting to list to starboard, making it impossible to safely launch anymore. At this point, Moss and several passengers went to the bridge to try to look for the crew, and found it completely empty. There was, there was nobody there. They did use the radio phone to broadcast a made a distress call, until Moss received a response, as there were still about 170 people left on board. He did receive a response, to which this rather horrifying, yet slightly amusing, exchange occurred. Where are you? I don't really know. Somewhere between East London and Durban. Can you give me your actual position? No. What is your rank? I'm the guitarist. Prior to all this happening, Lorraine had actually found the captain trying to get into one of the lifeboats. She did bring him back on board, but according to her, he seemed to have completely shut down and wasn't capable of directing the evacuation. But Moss had gotten a hold of rescue, and two smaller ships that were nearby began making their way towards the stricken Oceanos. And they weren't necessarily in the middle of the ocean at the time. They were actually within sight of the shore when all this was going on, the Wild Coast. And South Africa's search and rescue helicopters were scrambled, but it was the middle of the night. And given the rough seas, it was nearly impossible to actually mount a safe rescue until dawn broke. And that wouldn't be for four hours. But to Oceanus' credit, somewhere within her poorly maintained hull was a spirit of the grand ship she once used to be. And she held on. Despite the flooding, she did not sink until daybreak. The helicopters slowly began to take the last of the passengers off the ship. According to Moss, he had actually found the captain later at the back of the ship. He was having a cigarette, all alone out in the dark. He told him that they needed his help, but he just looked at him, wide-eyed, and just said, It's not necessary. It's not necessary. Moss felt that he was in deep shock. At this point, it seems that Avranus was less uncaring of the passengers and more in sheer denial of the situation, almost having some kind of panic attack or psychological break. Either way, he was not equipped to handle this at all. And according to one story, he was one of the first to be hoisted up to the helicopters, pushing another passenger out of the way, even though they demanded that he should stay. But regardless, they did get everyone off. And just 45 minutes after the last person was removed, Oceanos could hold on no longer. She sank beneath the waves, becoming the only death in the disaster. The aftermath of the accident was not exactly great for Avranis, who everyone immediately labeled a coward, and to be fair, that does seem to be pretty spot on. The media lambasted him, though he claimed that he had left the ship first to arrange for a rescue effort, and then supervised the rescue from a helicopter because the batteries of the crew's walkie-talkies had died, meaning that he had no communications with his crew, or with other rescue craft. Never mind the radio that was working on the bridge, no, 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 that's, that's not relevant. He was also quoted as saying, When I order, abandon the ship, it doesn't matter what time I leave. Abandon is for everybody. If some people like to stay, they can stay. A Avranus. Avranus. That's no, no, 
No, you... Listen, I might have felt a little bit of sympathy if you did have some kind of psychological break. Not everyone's cut out to handle these kind of situations. And it's clear that you didn't. But don't act callous about it now. Really, he should be thanking his lucky stars that nobody died. Because in 1992, he and five other officers were convicted of negligence by a Greek board of inquiry for fleeing the ship without helping the passengers, but he wound up serving no jail time as a result and was even allowed to keep his job. Oh yes, Aperitiki Lines gave him another command with a ferry and he continued working as a captain until he retired. Though thankfully, nothing else like this ever happened under his watch again. On the flip side, the entertainment staff, particularly Moss and Tracy, as well as a magician named Julian Butler, yes, a magician, all the entertainment staff was helping, when other the actual officers were, were hailed as heroes, as they had managed to keep the passengers calm and coordinate things to the best of their ability. Their actions saved many lives that day, and Moss, as well as Butler, were the last to leave, having basically stepped into the role that Avranis was unable to fulfill. To date, Moss and his wife are still together, and though they still kept working on ships, with Moss eventually becoming a cruise coordinator, Tracy doesn't really like doing interviews about the particular incident, as it was kind of a stressful situation, that's understandable. Though Moss has given plenty of talks about it, and seems to be an all-around decent guy at the end of the day. As for Oceanos, well, she now lies at a depth between 92 meters and 97 meters, roughly 5 kilometers or 3.1 miles offshore. So, it seems like she's pretty accessible, and divers have visited her, but there are very strong currents in that area, and that makes it pretty difficult to get down there. Photographs that were taken in 2002 show that her bridge section has collapsed, and naturally, she's likely to remain there. Though I think we can all thank both her and her entertainment staff that she is the only one that lies in that watery grave. And with that, as your host, Darkness the Curse, I would like to give a thank you to my generous patrons, my British Rail critics, and a special shout out to my underwater train finders, SomeDude267, Orange Glass, Benjamin Owens, Panzer Kitsune 131 232, Josh Johnson, Metal for Life Guy, Anzac A1, Arthur Roy, Tommy Rossini, Lord Captain Von Thrust III, Joshua Long, Brian, Jack Carson's Row Videos, Hayden DeGro, Master of None, Lord Hoff 444, That Guy with a Beard, Mark Holding, Murder Drone Stall, A Person 723, DM Trouble Typhoon, Alfonso Lapuche, Royal Hudson 2060, Icefer 1405, Charles Kwiatkowski, Matthew Wolf, Ohio Trucker 1, Mr. Sleepy, Matt Weaver, Albert Jaspers, Tom Red Lion, NS Productions 8104, Hannah Bird, Hendrick Motorsports Fan 5, Wheeljack 8401, Rescues Greyhounds, Dr. Ray 78, and The Baxter. Till next time, this is Darkness and a visual of fond farewell.